of it. Yeah, sure. It's Richard Felgate, isn't it? That's me. Yeah. And Peter. So I think we'll make a start, if we may, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there may be a few more people join us later on. It's a bit of a humming here at the moment, so uh, can everybody hear us? Yeah? Okay. All right, so welcome to this session, this lunchtime session on accelerating the transition to a green economy, benefits of investing in sustainability. So there'll be no, no sayers here then, will there? Well, we'll see about that. Um, I, I think it would be useful if we had uh, a lively debate. The format for today is as normal with three speakers, 10 minutes each to get across some messages they want to talk about on that particular theme, and then a question and answer session afterwards. So if you could hold your questions until the point when all three speakers have, have said their piece, that would be great. Um, my name is Malcolm Ball, and I work for the Green Investment Bank. We are particularly interested in the green agenda. That's what the bank was established to do. The mission of the bank is to support the acceleration of the UK's transition to a green economy. So what these guys are going to be talking about, particularly from a waste and an energy point of view, is particularly important to us in the bank. We've got three focus areas, offshore wind, waste and waste recycling, and energy efficiency. So we touch on not all, but a reasonable amount of the sustainability agenda. So what I'm going to do now is ask our speakers to stay, take the stand. I think it's Peter up first from UPS. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing people because they are going to talk a little bit about their companies and a bit about themselves. And Peter will, will introduce us to the points that he wants to make on the theme of acceleration, why sustainability is good. Peter. Okay, thanks, Malcolm, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Harris. Uh, as you can see from the slide, I'm the Director of Sustainability for UPS in Europe. Um, UPS is a logistics company. We move things around the planet. That's what we do for a living. Um, so I'm going to talk about why would it be uh, a good business idea for us as a company to want to invest in sustainability. So I think in order to understand why invest in sustainability, we have to start by agreeing on what sustainability is. And I'm going to suggest that we just really take our meaning from the dictionary. So if you think about what the word sustainable means, then that kind of leads you to the conclusion that a sustainable organization means one that is positioned to succeed in both the short and the long term. That's, that's what the word means, right? That's the, uh, that's the definition. So you could argue that's what everybody in business does every day, and, and actually that's true. So economic sustainability, the ability to manage your costs and, uh, and understand your markets and maximize revenue, that's all part of being sustainable. But it's, it's not the whole picture, or at least there's a significant part that we need to understand in a bit more detail. Uh, and that is the part that relates to the risks that societal challenges represent to business. And what I'm talking about here is getting into the field of the environment and social risks and understanding what those risks do to the economic sustainability of the business. So it all comes back in the end to economics. 
But unless we understand the environmental and social risks that our businesses face, we won't have a complete handle on our economic sustainability model. And I would characterize the risks associated with these challenges as really being, um, I would suggest, being and being seen as part of a problem. If you become linked to a societal issue and society starts to view you as being part of that problem, then I think you've got a challenge on your hands. So those risks need to be managed. And that management requires investment. So those risks come at business from a whole variety of sources that you will all recognize. Uh, for example, from government, um, there's a risk if you are seen as part of a societal problem by government that you will have regulations imposed upon your business that you don't like. Uh, and that will box you into a corner that you may not want to be in. There are risks to your brand of being seen as part of a problem, without a doubt. There are risks to your revenue because customers don't like to be associated with organizations that are seen as being part of a problem. And there are certainly risks also to your ability to engage employees because employees increasingly want to work for organizations that have an understanding of their place in society. There are also risks to your cost base because a lot of these things turn out to be about actually making yourself more efficient. So the good news is that we can replace that risk with opportunity by doing the right things in the right order. We can have the opportunity to shape government relations and thereby shape regulation and be ahead of regulation to enhance brand, to gain revenue from organizations that want to be associated with leaders in the space of um, social responsibility and to engage employees. So it's about converting risk into opportunity and that takes investment but the point is that it's an investment rather than a cost because an investment has a return and on this slide are the areas where the return comes from. So let me illustrate that from, from UPS's own perspective within uh, UPS Europe. So as I said, we're a, we're a transportation company. We move things around the planet, uh, primarily uh, things in boxes. That's our core business, rather a lot of them every day, actually many millions on a global basis. And as a result of that, there are two key societal challenges that are core to our business that we seek to convert from risk into opportunity in the way that I've been describing. The first of those is climate change, and, and that's because, because we're a, a, an asset-heavy organization. You know, we move things around using fleets of trucks and airplanes. We generate a lot of greenhouse gases, whether we like that or not. And the second challenge for us is the whole urban complex associated with air quality, congestion, and noise, uh, particularly prevalent uh, in the, the news today, the, the news about some of the uh, pollution that's sweeping over the country, um, air quality issues. Um, and that's important to us because we operate in just about every urban environment that there is in Europe or indeed uh, actually on the planet. So with those two, our investment is targeted in three key areas in order to manage those risks and to convert them into opportunity. Firstly, fuel efficiency. So this is a win-win because when you invest in fuel efficiency, not only do you address risk and turn it into opportunity, you also save money. So fuel efficiency really should be a no-brainer, although it's surprising how hard it is sometimes to, uh, to make traction in this area. So an example is uh, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is quite a large-scale deployment of telematics technology. So telematics is one of these new technologies that are coming of age today, uh, which are uh, all about the information revolution. And this is giving us the ability to see things within our business that we couldn't see before. It allows us to understand, for example, uh, do we have areas where our driver traces overlap that we didn't think they did? Uh, do we have instances of excessive idling taking place in our fleet that shouldn't be? 101 different areas of information that we can gather and then work with our operators and with our drivers to refine, to save fuel, but crucially also to save carbon emissions and therefore start to address the climate change challenge and to also um, address air quality, noise and congestion uh, challenges as well. So 
fuel efficiency is, is crucial and it really is a win-win. You, you, you win on the risks and you win on uh, cost as well. Uh, and when you look at the numbers within our business, efficiency is uh, the big, biggest single driver of making uh, progress uh, on, uh, on emissions. But it doesn't stop there. It also continues beyond fuel efficiency into alternative technologies. Once you've got to the point where you've uh, addressed all of the efficiency initiatives that you can, then the only way of addressing the remaining uh, carbon emissions and uh, air quality emissions within your business is to find other technologies other than the conventional ones. So an example for us would be uh, our investment in these biomethane powered HGVs. We think biomethane is a very promising HGV fuel technology. It's chemically the same as natural gas, so it works in a gas truck, and gas trucks are actually reasonably conventional now. They're quite well understood technologies. But the great advantage of biomethane is that it's an entirely renewable fuel. It comes from organic waste. The challenge is not so much making it work, the challenge is getting it. There's a big debate behind that, which involves government, which we could talk about a bit later maybe. So that's an example of alternative technology investment. And then the third one, the final one that I'll cover, um, is crucial to the concept of converting risk to opportunity because it's not enough just to do these things. You have to also reach out to all of those stakeholders that were in that spider diagram that I showed and actually uh, help them understand what you're doing. Uh, because otherwise, if they don't understand what you're doing, they're going to carry on thinking that you're part of the problem and not part of the solution. So reaching out is crucial, and an example of that for us in reaching out to our customers is uh, some, uh, some environmental uh, products that we have. This one that I'm illustrating here is called UPS Carbon Neutral, and it's an opportunity for customers to neutralize the carbon emissions from their shipments in our network uh, through us. We, uh, we use um, a small fee to invest in relevant offsetting products so that the customer has at the end of the day a carbon neutral shipment if that's what they want. So to wrap up, it's about being ahead of the risk so that you can turn that risk into opportunity. But crucially, it's also about not being too far ahead of the risk. I think one of the things we might want to talk about today is how far is too far. If you're behind the risk, that's certainly a problem. If you're too far ahead, it becomes a risk again because you find yourself in a space where you're operating with flaky technologies that aren't adequately proven and that can become expensive and difficult for the business. So there's an optimum position in front of the risk to try to position yourself, and that varies from company to company, and that's quite an interesting debate. But it's all about, in summary, being uh, not being part of the problem and not being seen as part of the problem, but being and being seen as part of the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, can I just ask again, can people hear? Because there's a huge amount of background noise here. People are okay? Okay, all right, fine. Thanks very much. All right, well, thanks very much for that, uh, Peter. That's very interesting. Um, I quite like the concept of not being <laughs> part of the problem. And I think sometimes people think that they, they're immune to the problem and they actually are part of it. So I think that's an interesting point you made there. Uh, can I ask Richard now, Richard Felgate, to take the uh, lectern and give us his, uh, his point of view. Richard works for MMB, um, and he'll explain a little bit more about what MMB do. I was quite ignorant, I have to say, when I first spoke to, to Richard. Um, and so he, he'll tell us about uh, what it's like for his, his organization in a customer-facing mode. Thanks, Malcolm, and uh, good afternoon. I think it's afternoon now, so afternoon, everybody. My name is Richard Felgate and I'm responsible for everything from an energy, environment and sustainability purpose in Mitchells and Butlers. Now you may be thinking, uh, Mitchells and Butlers, I might recognise that name, is it an old brewing name or who actually is Mitchells and Butlers? But just to give you an indication, we don't actually trade under the Mitchells and Butlers name within the UK, but we trade under the branded names of many of our businesses. So I'm sure there's many businesses up there that you'll be more than familiar with. Everything from O'Neill's to All Bar One to Brown's to Toby Carvery to Harvester to Crown Carveries to Ember Inns. They're all part of the Mitchells and Butlers group of companies. So probably some very familiar names, if not you're not so familiar with Mitchells and Butlers. All in all, we have 1,550 businesses up and down the UK. So that's basically everywhere from Plymouth to Perth. 
We serve 130 million meals a year and 420 million drinks, which just about makes us the largest restaurant company in the UK. One of the specific challenges we have is that 1,550 businesses are pretty diverse. They're everything from grade one country pub restaurants to city centre retail units on the high streets and retail parks. So, what does sustainability mean to Mitchells and Butlers and what have we been doing in respect of sustainability? We really started taking sustainability and the various aspects of it, uh, energy, environment and that, seriously, probably back in about 2008. But what you'll find within Mitchells and Butlers, we don't actually use the word sustainability. To me, the word sustainability conjures up a lot of different ideas and a little different expectations, different perceptions from all sorts of different people. Some think, people think it's about saving the planet, some think it's about just doing the right thing, but often people associate it with something that's going to have an additional cost impact rather than something that's going to be a saving to the business. So I tend to move away from the word sustainability within the Mitchells and Butlers. In many ways, looking back sort of five or six years ago when people are talking about green initiatives and that, very short period of time, green went from being the, the latest catchphrase and everyone was like, oh no, green thing is all about tree huggers and things like that. So a lot of people dropped the word green. To me, sustainability, the word sustainability in itself is in danger of being in a very similar position. It means too many different things to too many different people. Within Mitchells and Butlers, sustainability is really just all about good business practice. It's all about making sure that we're going to be successful in a world of diminishing resources in years to come. It's about good common sense business practice. No more, no less than that. So, what are the different aspects of sustainability? There's things that are going to make us directly more profitable, but there's other things as well. First of all, reputational enhancement. And that's with different groups of people. So, first of all, there's our customers. People now, when they're coming into businesses like ours, when they're going and visiting a lot of the main retailers, they expect you to be doing these sort of things. They might not be consciously making their decisions on where they go on the basis of it, but there's an expectation that you're doing the right thing. And certainly within our business, a lot of people come into our restaurants, into our pubs for their relaxation, their chill out time, for celebration with family and friends. So it's always not the thing that's at the forefront of their mind, but it's one of those subconscious boxes that if they see evidence of us doing the right thing, they think, yep, yeah, they're doing the right thing and I'm happy to be here. Employees. There's certainly a large element of employee motivation and satisfaction when people can see the evidence within the business that that business is striving to do the right things. And investors, a bit like customers, their expectation is now that they're doing, you're doing this and you're doing it right and you're doing it correctly. If they see an evidence of you working towards sustainable targets, even if you don't call it that, environmental concerns, energy reduction, again it's a tick, it's a sign of a well-run business, it's a sign of a business that's looking forward, looking at the risks and trying to mitigate those risks. There's other things that some people might not immediately think of as well from a sustainability, environment and energy angle. One big one for us are planning approvals. We have a programme of trying to open 40 to 50 new businesses each financial year and that can be a challenge in order to find good sites which are going to deliver us excellent returns. Often some of these sites might be in areas where it's quite difficult to get planning approvals. So when we're presenting to planning authorities, if we can present ourselves as a business that is taking environmental concerns, energy reduction seriously, then often it can give us a bit of a head start against the competition. Community engagement projects, a lot of our businesses, some of our ones in the suburbs, in sizzling pubs, ember inns, toby carveries, harvesters, they're at the heart of the community. And if we've got ways and means of conveying some of the messages and some of the work that we're doing with people in those communities, then we build a stronger relationship. We get community engagement projects and that business is then seen at the heart of the community and that helps obviously when it comes to sales. 
other areas, times 100. A lot of businesses always aspire to try and get into the times 100 for the best employers. They've got seven key categories when you're looking to get into Times 100. And one of the key questions in there is giving something back. Giving something back to communities, giving something back to employees, giving some people back to all of the people that have an interest in your business. Very important. And then one of the things that we just heard about earlier, risk mitigation. As much as you try to, as a business, you're not going to be able to do everything 100% perfectly all of the time. But what people look for is that you can demonstrate that one, you set the right targets, you set the right aspirations. So when every now and again, you maybe someone comes across something and says, you know what, Mitchells and Butlers, you're not too sharp in that area. We think you might be able to improve. We're in a, in a position there where we can say, yep, thanks for that, but look at all the other great stuff that we're doing. And if you didn't have that array and all those examples, then you, know, you could get caught out. So there's definitely a risk mitigation strategy. And then there are the directly profitable elements of this. So reducing energy costs. There's not a single business in the UK that hasn't seen their energy costs increase from a commodity point of view over recent years. So the more you can do to mitigate that, the better. Increasing recycling. Recycling within our businesses. Recycling of the suppliers and the equipment that comes into it. Less wastage in food preparation, in even working with plate sizes with customers and trying to reduce wastage in that respect. And then trying to mitigate wastage that goes to landfill and reducing on landfill costs. So, just a few specific examples. And a lot of my background recently has been looking after mitigation of energy costs. So two or three of the projects that we've rolled out within Mitchells and Butlers over the last couple of years and the type of benefit that we've been getting back from that. People often say, start with the simple things. Often a lot of people, they go looking for these highly innovative, you know, really challenging and maybe real problematic areas. One of the areas we started with, let's just make sure all of our buildings are insulated properly. I'm sure everyone at home understands the, the benefits of insulation, draft exclusion and the like. We undertook a project and excluding the city centre buildings of ours where we've just got ground floor tenancies on retail units, we insulated about 1,300 of our businesses over a period of just under two years. The energy savings were immediate. We were getting 40% savings and the payback of the whole project was in less than two years. But not only did we get the energy benefit, which is the thing that obviously my financial director and the board are interested in, but we turned some areas of our businesses from being that little cold corner where no one wanted to sit to also all of a sudden being that really nice intimate corner of the business where everyone wanted to sit first. So we've got some really positive feedback from the business as well. LED lighting. You walk around a show like this and there's LED lights everywhere. And we'd been reviewing the LED market starting six or seven years ago. And then at a point about three years ago, the market reached a maturity where the quality of lighting, dimming capabilities, beam angles, lumen outputs was good enough for us to invest in it. Because the one big thing that we said is ambience. You don't want to walk into one of our businesses and feel it lit up bright white light like a big canteen. You come in there because it's a nice soft environment. So we over the last two years have rolled out LED lighting within our estate. We've changed 237,000 lamps. That's a lot. That's a lot. And it's paid back in less than a year. Wherever possible, we try and take out human intervention. We spend a lot of time working with our employees about behavioural stuff. But, you know, like a lot of things like that, behavioural programmes, one, take quite a lot of time to get traction. And also you get different levels of engagement from people. So if I can automate something and take out that human intervention, then that's always a first choice for me. So be it automating kitchen extract systems that detect the amount of cooking activity that goes on underneath and varies the fan speed accordingly, to timers on beer cooling systems. We've tried to automate a lot of those things and been pretty successful. So again, we're getting paybacks that are less than two years. What does that all mean to us if you start to add it up? Well, very simply put, the red line on there 
that's where we'd have been if we hadn't have engaged with any of these issues or faced any of these challenges or tried to reduce our consumption. The blue line represents where we actually are. So you can see we really started to take this seriously back in 2008 and since then we've had a steady decline in our overall consumption. It did very marginally rise between 2010, 2011, but that was more about growing our estate and growing our food volumes, so the business was getting bigger, but we were still mitigating most of that. All in all, that's a cumulative benefit of about 60 million pounds to us. So when I sit down and say I want to have a word with our FD, his response to me is often, well, how much money do you want, Richard, now? You know, we've got that ability, we've got that traction, we've got the confidence in the board. So to us, it's all about just common sense business, making sure that we're going to be here in a world where we've got diminishing resources, more challenge for those resources in years to come, and we're maximising our profitability through it. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much. I think that was an interesting challenge for, with such a large portfolio of properties. Um, one of the barriers to the deployment of energy efficiency is often seen as aggregation, you know, la a, a large number of interventions in lots and lots of different properties. And it seems like you've managed to crack it. Well, at least some of the technologies anyway, if not all of them. And, and I'm sure your finance director is very pleased with you. So can I ask uh, Dexter, Galvin next to uh, t take the lectern, please, and give us his views. Galvin works for the what was formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. Thank you very much, Malcolm. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I am not going to use slides, so those of you with notebooks are going to have to listen very carefully. Um, so my name is Dexter Galvin. I run the supply chain program at CDP. Um, today I'm going to give you a bit of background to CDP and a bit of an overview of what we do. And then I'm going to look at the um, issue of accelerating the solutions to a green economy, uh, accelerating the transition to a green economy, because we've got quite a few solutions at CDP and quite a lot of data to share with you about these issues. Um, so CDP was founded back in 2000 to accelerate the, um, to accelerate solutions to climate change by putting relevant data at the heart of business, policy, and investment decisions. Now, essentially, CDP built up around a questionnaire that we send on behalf of major investment organizations to large listed corporations. We ask them for data on climate change, carbon, water, and forests. Um, it's a significant group of investors. They represent about $87 trillion worth of assets under management. I think there's rather a bit of double counting in there. Um, but essentially, the point is it's a very significant catalyst group of investors that are asking large listed corporations to disclose their data through CDP. So we sit on a vast mine of climate change data and what companies are doing on this issue. The program that I run is the um, supply chain program. And we've taken that model of using an authority to get data from large companies. So we've taken that model of using the investors um, and we've actually started to work with major purchasing organizations to get their suppliers to disclose that carbon climate change data through our system. And we've had some considerable success since Walmart came to us in 2008 and asked us to do this for the first time. We now have 70 major global corporations working with us on gathering this data from their key suppliers. Um, those 70 major corporations represent about 1.15 trillion of annual purchasing spend. And actually that's a more meaningful figure than the 87 trillion that our investors represent because our procurement guys are really involved and really using this data that's coming back from the companies. Um, so it's a really powerful catalyst group that's interested in driving change in the supply chain. And a lot of the companies like UPS can actually justify a lot of their internal projects by saying, hey, our customers are demanding this sort of information from us and they're really pushing this agenda. So companies like Walmart, Unilever, major global household names are pushing this issue in the supply chain. 
Um, so I think it's great that we're discussing this issue of accelerating the transition to a low carbon or green economy um, today. I think it's incredibly pertinent given the report from the IPCC um, saying that nobody on the planet will be untouched by the issue of climate change in the future. I think it's a really good time for us to address these issues. Um, we see from our data a massive opportunity in this area, huge. Last year we had 2,800 suppliers respond to our request for data. Those 2,800, 30% of them disclosed $11.5 billion of savings from uh, emissions reductions activities. And that's only 30% of those suppliers. Imagine what, imagine what could happen if the rest of the suppliers were also realizing savings from these um, emissions reductions activities. This could be the next industrial revolution. It's huge amount of potential. So uh, give, uh, being aware of that level of potential uh, our, there is unfortunately a gap in performance between our member companies, these big major global purchasing organizations, and their suppliers. Um, if we take as an indicator investment in low carbon technology last year in 2013, 84% um, of our member companies were disclosing investments in low carbon technology, but only 29% of suppliers were disclosing that investment. So I'd, I suppose on the part of these large purchasing functions, there's a degree, degree of impatience. Um, they want to see their suppliers improve their performance, and they want to see more rapid deployment of low carbon technology in the supply chain. Um, so we've actually been working on a couple of projects at CDP on doing exactly this, this accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy by using these levers that we have at our disposal. So on the investor side, we've started using investors to get them to talk to companies about actually showing demonstrable emissions reductions and disclosing that in the annual disclosure process. On the supply chain side of things, I see collaboration as a solution to all of these problems. So collaboration across the value chain has the, the potential to really drive change in the supply chain. Um, so we've launched this program called Action Exchange. We've seen three major barriers when we're looking at the data that comes back from these suppliers every year. We've seen three major barriers to deployment of low carbon technology. I think the first one is actually an issue of priority. A lot of companies have, they know what emissions reductions activities they could undertake. They have projects sitting on the shelf that have payback periods of less than a year in many cases, less than three years in most cases. And um, they're just simply not prioritizing those projects. The second thing is expertise. For those that know and have been disclosing for a number of years, um, they, they're wondering what's the next step. They've realized the sort of low-hanging fruit of energy efficiency, and they're thinking, what is our next step now? And they don't know what that next step is. And then the third and, and, and less significant one, I would suggest, is financing. Um, I think uh, companies tend to, to propose finance as an issue when they don't know what other issues they have in the organization, or they can't, um, they can't actually um, put together projects. So w we've actually found that financing is probably less significant, and I'll go into that in more detail later. But um, briefly, Action Exchange addresses all of these barriers. So the first barrier, priority. We've taken the customer request, and we've actually formalized it in such a way that the customer is now demanding that the supplier invests in low carbon technology if it has a payback period of less than three years. If the supplier chooses not to invest, um, their CFO or FD equivalent has to feed back to their customer and say, hey, the reason that we didn't do this was because it's simply not a priority for our business. Um, now, you can imagine that conversation with somebody who's purchasing 300 million $400 million of goods every year from you. Um, so we're pushing that agenda right up the list of priorities in our member organizations. And this gets the sustainability person in the supplier organization who knows what to do in front of the CFO using that customer pressure. So it's a very powerful tool. Um, 
On expertise, we've done analysis of the supplier responses. We've helped them identify where the opportunities are. We worked with academic institutions in the US and a, a rather Stalinist sounding organization called the Institute for Industrial Productivity, but they're very good. And we've, they've been helping us identify opportunities in the, uh, in the supply chain. And um, then we've, uh, we've started to look at the financing element. Remember the 87 trillion that, that I mentioned at the outset? They're our investors, the people that give us legitimacy. Um, well, actually, many of those organizations, and we have the Green Investment Bank here, um, many of those organizations have made commitments to loan to low carbon technology projects and ha are struggling in some instances to find a route to market and find the projects ready to go. So, as we build up these projects, we hope to build a pipeline for this future financing of the projects as well. So um, I think that's an exciting solution. It's one of many. Um, I think collaboration across the supply chain is huge. Last year, our suppliers proposed 2,100 collaborative opportunities to their customers through our systems. So these are examples of suppliers saying, hey, um, you know, the way we transport the goods to you is really inefficient. Why don't we work together to make it a more efficient solution? Um, the packaging that we use on that product is really heavy. Why don't we work together to reduce that? So um, really exciting um, possibilities from collaboration across the supply chain. I think that's a potential solution to these grave problems that we're facing as a society and uh, I look forward to reporting back in the future on what our member companies are doing next year so thank you very much Dexter, thank you okay ladies and gentlemen I, I've written down half a dozen questions but it's not I don't want to abuse my my privilege as a chairman I'd like to open it up to the floor if you don't then I will I will ask a few questions myself but in front of you here, you've got two people that have done it for their organizations. They've won the finance director over. They've proved that the savings can occur. So if you want to learn from them, now's the time to do it. And then also Dexter, who's worked with a number of organizations, is obviously really familiar with the barriers and also really good at remembering statistics without any notes, which I thought was incredibly impressive. Um, so why not take a, a, the opportunity in this next 20, 25 minutes or so to ask them a few questions? So I think there's a roving mic. There is. Uh, hello there. Um, thank you. Uh, wow, I'd like to say it. Wow. Um, but thank you because it's extraordinarily positive. Uh, love the fact that you're talking about collaboration. Love the fact you're talking about looking for solutions and forgetting about the challenges, etc. Um, so my name is Chris Pomfret. I live in Oxford. I run a, uh, a, a massive buying group called Community Buying Unlimited. So we represent the, the, the purchasing decisions of thousands of people who are in companies and communities. And Dexter, uh, uh, a question for you. How do I get um, a supply industry that does not talk to each other, is not interested in carbon uh, anything, um, doesn't, in fact, doesn't even know what a carbon mission is if it hits on, an, on, on those, because it's unregulated, and delivers a product that's extraordinarily important to 1.4 million homes around the UK. I'm talking about heating oil, all right? That's your question. And your question, guys, you've proved to the finance director that this works. When is my MP, who's David Cameron, going to prove to his finance director that it's not green crap and it does actually work? What have we actually got to do to put stats in front of him to actually believe, to make him believe he can actually be the greenest prime minister ever? So the, I think the question, the two questions, if I just re, re, respond, is uh, how do we get the supply chain together and how do we get the chancellor to be more engaged? Dexter. Okay, well, I, I would suggest you, you, you find out who the customers are and um, you um, bring together the customers in a forum uh, where possible without any sort of hint of collusion or anything like that. Um, but you bring them together to collaborate in order to engage with the suppliers on this um, because I think that's probably the, the key. It comes from customer pressure and, and then um, that justifies all of the innovations that happen up the supply chain. Um, and I think when, once you build a collaboration like that, um, you can then use that to justify your work and talk to government and talk to other, uh, talk to other industry bodies and regula regulators saying, we have this catalyst group, we, we've all decided that this is an important thing to do. Um, so, you, and then you use that as your, as your uh, talking point or your uh, launch pad, I would say. 
Richard, what, what do you do in supply chain in your business? Because you must have an enormous supply chain. We do have an enormous supply chain, and it's, you know, it's a real big challenge trying to work with that. Um, I think the really interesting one is about how do we get the Chancellor on board and you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> well, go on, ask um, the second question. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really sort of interested in this one because it, it, it's a massive, massive challenge. And uh, I think you know, if I could get the Chancellor to be on board and uh, you know, do everything to for everyone, then I'd probably be the most successful Prime Minister in history. All I can do really is relate to what we do within our business and how I've gone about getting our business, how I've gone about getting our FD, our CEO on board. And some of the things that I've seen people where they, you know, they've failed. And as an energy manager, as a sustainability person within a business, you've got to have a whole new multitude of skills. It's not just about being able to find technical solutions, about being able to deliver behavior change. You've actually got to have a very, very fundamentally sound business background and business acumen. You need to be able to present things to a board in a way that, you know, okay, it'll be open to challenge, but you're presenting them with the right information, the right facts. What I hear so often is people who are absolutely petrified of going into their board to present something because they haven't got a clue what's going to happen. You know, they're thinking, what's the curveball? What's going to get thrown at me? What questions are going to be asked? What am I going to be challenged on? If I go into one of our board meetings and I felt like that, then I don't think I've done my job prior to it. When I go into one of our board meetings, I like to feel that's really the rubber stamping and I've done all of my hard work prior to it. So I'll understand, you know, what are the pressures that our FD's got at that any one particular time? You know, if we're coming up towards year end, are we just short on sales? Are we just short on profitability? What are the triggers that are sort of pulling him? What might the operational concerns be? And I'll sit down with these people in advance of going to the board and say, let me just talk you through this. This is the way I'm intending to present it. You know, is there anything I haven't thought of? What queries have you got? Is there a way I can do this slightly better? So all of a sudden, you know who your key decision makers are and you're getting these people on board one by one. So when I go into that board meeting, one, if it starts to get a little bit tricky, I can call on some of these people and, you know, oh, what do you think of this? And ask, you know, a bit of a loaded question because I know what they're going to say as an answer. And hopefully you've got that support and it really is just the rubber stamping. Um, it is it's a difficult one, but so many people, I think, you know, are quite naive and they think just because they've got a compelling business case that people are just automatically going to say, yes, you know, you've got to start. Sometimes you've got to start with little small projects build up credibility of getting approval, delivering something, getting those returns on investment, letting the business see those returns on the investment, let the FD go back and report to the board independently of yourself and say, you know what, what Richard came and said that he was going to deliver, he's delivered it. So next time you go there, you've got another tick on the credibility ladder and everything's that a little bit easier. Quite how we change that into to politics and uh, the Chancellor, I'm not too sure, but hopefully that's a bit of an insight into how we tackle it. Well, I think that's very interesting. R Richard, do you, do you have anything on the supply chain from your point of view? Is it, is it a big issue for you in terms of encouraging the supply chain to do their own thing with, with, uh, on the sustainability agenda? So working up and down our supply chain. Yeah, it, it, it is an interesting uh, um, and quite a challenging area. And I would agree with Dexter's point about the importance of collaboration. So, for example, within uh, the, uh, the transportation business, there are some organizations, I'll give you an example of one, called Green Freight Europe, which is where um, a, a whole cohort of European freight transport operators who see this subject through the same sort of lens that I've been trying to present have gotten together and said, we're stronger in numbers. We're stronger together. So Green Freight Europe is then able to take a combined voice to the market, a combined voice to the EU. Um, and there's a, an equivalent example of that in the UK, which is run by the Freight Transport Association called the Logistics Carbon Reduction Scheme, which operates in a very similar way. So collaboration is a very uh, key part of accelerating this uh, th this move without a doubt. But I would just like to, to say, I'm going to play devil's advocate on the, the previous question. I'm actually going to defend the Chancellor, just, just to a certain extent. Not excessively, but what I would say is there are very few countries in the world who have legally binding carbon targets yep. uh, in their uh, legislative framework. We do. Yeah. Very few countries have actually done that. We are, for example, the owners of the world's largest offshore wind farm. That's not an insignificant investment. Yeah. So 
I, I don't think the, uh, the the Chancellor is being completely indolent on this. I, th I think the, it's a it's a question of one of the things I put up in my slide is where do you position yourself in, in, in relation to the risk? The, the challenge for the UK is I, th I think the risk is understood and the need for action is understood, but we can't afford to be too far ahead of the risk by being isolated and on our own. We need to be working to bring the other countries of the global community with us in the same way as collaboration works within supply chains. Collaboration has to work with, between countries as well. So it comes back to the importance of the, uh, the, um, the climate change agreement um, protocols and uh, discussions that are uh, building up for Paris next year. So it all gets very complicated, but I think, I think there is a dawning awareness within the, uh, the business community and the political community now that we can't continue at the current pace. We have to ramp things up. Uh, that's very interesting. One of the things that uh, um, struck me over the last four years is how much has carried on despite the difficult economic circumstances we've had in this country, actually. I, I did fear in 2007, 2008 that things would fall off a cliff, personally, and that it all just get washed away. Um, and actually, it's carried on, I think, quite strongly. And I think, although there's been that unfortunate comment made in the press that, that the Prime Minister or the Chancellor made, um, I, I think one needs to think of them as the finance director and the chief executive of a company, and they've got a difficult job to make, and they're trying to make everything work and balance, and it's very easy just to shove this off the agenda. And I, and, and I think, you know, I, th I agree with you. I think we're doing not too bad. Probably not as good as everybody would want, but, but, but not too bad. But that's not to let them off the hook. Another question, please. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Paul Foley. I'm a consultant and I work on retainer uh, for uh, a company called uh, Lucico. We make LED, we're an LED manufacturer, amongst other things. Um, Dexter, I was interested, that you, you talked a lot about finance, uh, of course. It's what, you, it's, it's what the CDP is there to, to work with. And then you said, but you don't think that finance tends to be as big an obstacle as people imagine. So. Looking at that, and I listened to what Peter said as well, and you've, you're, you're talking about how hard it is to implement things that seem very obvious, things that, that should be done, fuel efficiency, and yet you say it's difficult to get done. So normally what you find is there's some sort of inertia problem, as it were. It's, it's, it's not that there isn't the finance, it's how do you get the finance to activate the action that's required and, and, and so on and so forth. So with reference to that, uh, Richard, you managed to get all this stuff done. Now, I'm sort of wondering how Mitchell and Butler's is financed. Are, you're a, are you highly leveraged as a company? Do you, I mean, you're improving your estate. You own your buildings, right? So I'm just kind of interested in how you manage to overcome that inertia problem, as it were, to get this stuff implemented, given your financial structure. So if you could explain mm -hmm. how the financial structure works, I'd, I'd then appreciate the answer from there. Okay. Um, first of all, our estate is predominantly all freehold. Um, probably about 90% of our estate is freehold, but as you'd probably anticipate, a lot of our city centre locations where we're in retail parks or we're in ground floors of retail um, precincts, we're on leaseholds there. Our financing structure for the business is probably 50% um, debt-based and 50% shareholders. We're FTSE 250, um, 200 company. So, one of the advantages that we've got as a business is that we, uh, all of our customers who come into our businesses pay as they leave. We get the cash in the till every night. So, you know, we've got no sort of um, problems really from a cash perspective. We're a very cash rich company at the moment and we, you know, we are actively seeking acquisition and expansion, but with the right businesses. So cash isn't a problem. Then you've got to get into demonstrating the, the returns and you know, what you can achieve. And when I first started trying to drive some of the energy efficiency projects throughout our business, I purposely started relatively small. I think some people, you know, they see some of these big wins, they're very ambitious. And, but I started relatively small with a small number of projects which had a compelling business case and yes, there was a little bit of a struggle to get those through because it was something that was new to the business. We hadn't invested in energy efficiency before. It, you know, we're used to investing in refurbishing restaurants, building new restaurants. That's what we've been doing for the last hundred years. We've got a really good track record. We understand it. I was introducing something new into the business. So I started with small projects. 
I really engaged with the FD and the financial team. So I don't undertake these projects. I'd let the finance guys measure the return, look at the half hourly data, do whatever they needed to do. And hopefully encourage them to report back to the board on the success of it rather than it just coming from me all the time. So if someone else was going back to the board and you know, um, singing the merits of what we were doing, that was only going to help what I was trying to do. And what that does, as I said before, it starts to build up your credibility, it starts to build up your success rating to the point now where no one really questions what I do when I go back because they know that if I'm going back for a million pounds worth of investment, I'll have done the necessary trials, I'll have you know, tested it to destruction, and because I've got that track record of delivery, it's, it's quite simple. The balance then starts to come. Well, maybe I've got a whole raft of things. I could spend 20, 30 million pounds a year. Maybe we start looking at um, you know, investing in wind or you know, big solar farms and things like that. You then have to start and look at the investment profile of your business because although we've got lots and lots of cash, we're only ever going to spend a certain proportion of that on energy efficiency. In the same way as, well, why don't we buy farms and you know, have our own cattle? Why don't we have our own turkey farms for our chickens and that? So when people invest in missiles and butlers, they're investing in us because our risk profile is all about restaurants and pubs and retail. That's what they're investing into. They're not investing into us because our risk profile is about you know, significant energy generation, for example. So there's always that balance to be had internally. And you know, the FD will often remind me when I have some of these ideas and I say, let me just talk to you about this one. And he goes, yeah, it's really great, Richard, but yeah, come back a little bit. Um, so there's a lot of tensions like that, but the big thing for me is all about gaining credibility and build, building a track record. And you know, starting small, doing your homework, understanding the pressures on the business when you're going for approvals, understanding who the key decision makers are, talking to those in advance. So when you do go into that board meeting, it's nearly a foregone conclusion of what the outcome is going to be. So the answer is start small, involve all your stakeholders and build confidence. That seems to be the message mm. there. There was a gentleman over there, sorry, yeah, you had a question. Uh, hi there, my name is James Miller. I'm a consultant as well. Um, I'm interested in the next steps, really. Um, we've heard quite a bit from the two gentlemen on the right as I look at the stage uh, on what you've done so far, and obviously a lot of uh, savings in terms of uh, immediate energy efficiency and so on. Dexter, I think you men mentioned at some point uh, that you had a, a project called Next Steps, but I'm not sure you actually uh, then told us what they were. Is it possible for you to outline what you see as being the next steps in sustainability, possibly over the next five to 10 years after the immediate savings of uh, energy efficiency programs have been uh, taken into account? Yeah, um, so particularly on that, we've, I've been watching um, a lot of the member companies that we've been working with, the big corporations, the PepsiCo's, the Coca-Cola's, the Walmart's, um, they've been working on disclosure for a number of years, they've been disclosing their emissions, and they've realized all the sort of low-hanging fruits of, um, and we'll, we'll have this here as well, um, they've sort of realized the low-hanging fruits of energy efficiency, um, they've, they've made all the sort of savings on the, the, the easy side of the carbon abatement cost curve, right? Um, so any, any big uh, emissions reductions now are gonna come from significant capital expenditure. Um, and I was going to tie it into the point that you made there. Um, I was with uh, AstraZeneca a number of years ago, and we were looking at um, the request that was coming through CDP from the cabinet office, who was asking them to disclose their uh, carbon emissions, and the first government in the world to ask their suppliers to do that, I might add. And um, they were getting this data, and they had an internal acceptable payback period of two to three years for projects. And um, the, they wanted to make a big investment in renewables. So they, um, they, they had to think outside the box and bring other variables into the equation. So of course, they brought the fact that the cabinet office, the government estate, was asking them 
to disclose this information, that it was top of their list of priorities, and that enabled them to justify extending their internal payback period, um, which was quite an, ex a, an interesting example of how you use customer pressure to drive these things. But as I was saying, with these big corporations, they've realized all of that. So now they're looking to their supply chain for these collaborative projects, because their suppliers won't have had anywhere near the experience that they have. They won't have the same sophistication. They still have a lot of that uh, low-hanging fruit, let's say, to pluck. Um, more broadly, um, I think government will be forced into, um, and I mean global government, will be forced into a sort of a knee-jerk reaction after years of um, being very slow on the regulatory front. And I think if businesses aren't prepared um, and you know, measuring their impacts, managing their impact, they will really suffer once regulation kicks up a notch. Um, so we work quite closely actually with the uh, Director General of the Ministry of Finance in China who's looking at this issue in their supply chain as well. And you'll, you'd be surprised at the amount of uh, regulatory developments in China on this particular issue. Um, so I think, I think it's looking outside your own operations, looking into the supply chain, realizing the opportunity of that, but me definitely managing the risk there as well, uh, regulatory and increasingly, unfortunately, physical. Good, Peter, could I bring you in there? Because I think transport is a really interesting area. Everybody focuses on buildings, and or traditionally focus on buildings. It's things that we all understand. Transport is relatively new in this agenda. There's a lot of talk about it. What, what's next for, for UPS on the transport front? So it, it's interesting, the, the question, first of all, where the focus is. And, and I, so I'd just quickly like to say something about that. So focus needs to be where the problem is. And, and that depends on the, the nature of your business. So in our case, because we're a transportation business, if we actually look at our global carbon footprint, about 90% of it is actually mobile. Only 10% is actually less than 10% of it is fixed in our buildings. Yeah. And that's why we focus very much on our mobile footprint for our airlines and, our, uh, and for our, our ground fleet. What's next? So uh, uh, when you look at the numbers that, that drive um, emissions reduction within our business, it, it, it starts with mo modal shift is the big, the big thing that you can do that makes the biggest difference. In other words, getting things out of the sky onto the ground off trucks onto railways and off railways into the ocean. That's, that's a big thing. We've done a lot of that. The next big thing is efficiency. We've been talking a lot about efficiency, and um, we've been doing a lot of that. There are still new technologies coming to the fore that will help us be even more efficient, like telematics, but we've done a lot of that over the years. So the next big thing, I think, is about the, uh, the, the dawning age of alternative technologies. That, that's where the world is going now. We, we're at, we're at the, uh, the point where the only real solution to uh, the bulk of the remaining carbon uh, challenge remains in shifting off of conventional fossil fuels onto something else. That's what's going to have to happen. Uh, and that's where a huge amount of uh, technological research is underway right now. And there are great opportunities to be gained by organizations that position themselves in the forefront of that work. So I, I, I had a caveat that I put in one of my slides about positioning yourself correctly in relation to the risk. You, you certainly don't want to be behind the risk because that's where you find yourself boxed into corners that you don't want to be in and people start seeing you as part of the problem. You also don't want to be too far ahead of the risk because you can end up trying to operate flaky technologies that aren't reliable. It's about making that judgment as to the optimum position in relation to the risk, being seen to be in the vanguard, being seen to be innovative, being seen to be a leader getting that to reflect on your brand and to attract customers and to engage employees and getting in the room with the regulators. So you know, we have a lot of work underway, for example, with our uh, UK fleet to uh, electrify a lot of what we're doing in our city center operations. That's very interesting to local government and it's very interesting to them because they are very concerned about air quality emissions. And they're very concerned about air quality emissions because our air quality standards in the UK in many cities don't meet European regulatory standards. We don't have very healthy cities. So governments want to work with people who are prepared to get out there and invest in these technologies. And if you're prepared to do that, you can then be in the room, you can be shaping regulation, you can be seen uh, as an innovator, and then government wants dialogue with companies of that type. That's the space to be in. It's the right pitch between being behind and too far ahead of the risk. It's that optimum position. And Richard, are we going to see solar panels all over the roofs of your pubs and solar thermal and biomass boilers in the future, and wind turbines, or 
What's, what's next for you? It's a really interesting question. And uh, do you know what my honest answer is? I don't know. And I think that's one of the fascinating and exciting things about being in this industry. Uh, if I had looked, if I just rewind the clock back five years ago and said, someone asked me, what will I be doing in five years' time? I wouldn't have predicted half the things that we're doing because all of those technologies have come to the front. We've worked with manufacturers, we've worked with developers, we've worked with innovators to try and get products which are quite bespoke to the hospitality and leisure industry to work within our environment. And internally, even my FD he turns around to me and says, well, surely you're going to run out of things to do soon, aren't you, Richard? You know, when's that going to happen? But you only need to walk around shows like this and, OK, there's a lot of people, you know, and it's repetitive things, but every now and again you see little glimmers of things and you think, you know, there's a great idea there. Some of the things that we're doing now in our business, we've got heat recovery from sellers. Think about that one. That sounds really, really counterintuitive, but it works. If you want to know how, then come and ask me afterwards. So it's things like that. And, you know, how can we make things more efficient, some of the new technologies? So I'm always optimistic that, you know, there's going to be quite a long supply chain and longevity of this reduction. But what I'll also do is echo what Dexter was saying. It's very, very easy when you're looking at the low-hanging fruit, you're looking at making efficiencies within your own business, directly relating to energy consumption and that. But we're starting now to look beyond that into our supply chain. We have a huge amount of knowledge in excess of what some of these guys got. So if we can help share some of that with the supply chain, make them more efficient, and then also we become a supplier of choice. So you know, when times get harder, when supplies start to you know, become more fragile, and they think, well, you know, who am I going to stay um, true to? Well, hopefully Mitchells and Butlers, because we work with them in a collaborative way, they will do so. And we've got examples of that all the way from energy through to our food supply chain where we're working with farmers and we're working with um, stocks of beef and cattle and that in order to make sure that our supply chain in that respect is sustainable. So I think you know, there's just so, so much to go at. It's actually what do you do first? And it's trying to prioritise, again, where your risks are, where your opportunity is, concentrate on a few things, do those well and then try and expand it out from there. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now 1.30. This session finishes, which seems to me to be a bit of a shame because actually we're on a bit of a roll here and I think <laughs> these guys could keep talking for a long time. And if you do have any questions, please do come after, up after we've finished and, uh, and, and pose your questions one-to-one. -one. Can I also ask you to join me in thanking Richard, Peter and Dexter for their contribution this afternoon. It takes a lot of effort to, to put a few slides together and come along and speak to everybody. And, and one of the things that's impressed me of this, out of this last hour is the, the enthusiasm that still exists. But people who've been in the business and been doing this for a long period of time, and yet they're still incredibly enthusiastic. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. So please do give them a, a round of applause. We're done.